Hello everybody, this is David. In this video I'm going to talk about how I went about reading uh, the 3-axis accelerometer on the Nexus A7 using SPI in Verilog. Now if you don't want to, if you don't have a Nexus A7, you don't want to go out and buy one, you can do this on the basis 3. You just will absolutely need this PMOD right here, PMOD ACL2, which has the same exact chip, the ADXL362, that's on the Nexus A7. The first thing to check out is the uh, Digilent Reference Manual for the Nexus A7. And section 13 is where they talk about the accelerometer. This first paragraph here gives you some information about it. Um, in particular, the 12-bit output resolution. There's also an 8-bit format of data for more efficient single byte transfers. And it says right here, the FPGA can talk with the sensor via SPI interface. And while the sensor is in measurement mode, it continuously measures and stores acceleration data in the X, Y, and Z registers. And here is the interface between the Arctic 7 and the sensor. Um, so the, the SPI interface is recommended clock frequency of 1 to 5 megahertz. Um, the SPI operates in SPI mode 0. Which is CPOL0 and CPH0. I'll talk about more, more about this stuff later. I'm not going to get into the interrupts. Here's the data sheet for the sensor, the ADXL362. Um, I had to go through this thing very meticulously. There's a lot of information in here that you need. And um, I'll go through my presentation and it, it, I'll have the information that was really pertinent from this data sheet so I'm not going to go through it right here. First I want to talk about SPI like what is SPI you can see you have a master and then you have your slave devices here and really the interface between the master is four signals and for however many you can have however many slaves you want but you need a, a slave select line um, or the CS line chip select line for each slave. And it has the, the S clock, which is a serial clock, the MOSI, which is master out, slave in. So this is the line that the master would send data to the slave. The MISO is master in, slave out. So that's the line where the information from the slave comes back to the master. And then the chip select line. So talking about different SPI modes, there's four different modes, C pole, uh, and they correspond to C pole and CPH can either be zero or one. So for our sensor, we're C pole zero, CPH zero, which means the C pole, it means that when the S clock is not being transmitted, when you're not to the sensor, when you're not communicating with the sensor, um, C pole means that the S clock is chilling out at the low period. It's in, it's in zero, it's low. And then when you wanna initiate transmissions, then you allow the S clock to transmit to the slave and what the CPH means a zero means that the data this red dotted line represents when the data is valid CPH zero means the first clock edge CPH one means the second clock edge so if we're doing C pole zero CPH we're going to hang the S clock out of zero and then on the first clock edge which will be a positive clock edge is when the data is valid and that's more demonstrated right here with um, C pole and CPH zero. The S clock is at zero, the first clock edge, the that's where we want the data to be valid on the MISO and the MOSI line. Now we get into some of the what was in, in the data sheet. So what I found out is that after the device powers up, um, after five milliseconds, it goes into a standby mode. And then during standby mode, there's no measurement functions going on. So the first thing you have to do is write to the device the register, which is the 2D register, or what they call the power control register. And these last two bits, um, you have to change it to one zero to put it in measurement mode. You can see when you power it on or when it's reset, all the bits are zero. So that means it goes into standby. So the first thing you do is write to this register and put it in measurement mode. Here's how the data format comes out. We get 8 bits of MSB and 8 bits of LSB for each axis, X, Y, and Z. The sign bit is the 12 bit here. That's why they're talking about 12 bits of precision. You have the 12 bit is the sign bit and then 11 bits of data. 
and then the, the other four bits in the MSB are just sign extended. So whatever this bit three is, bit four, five, six, and seven will be the same thing. So for this project, I'm um, because I only have 16 LEDs, and I want to put so I can put five bits per access data on 15 LEDs. I'm going to take the sign bit, and then I'm going to take four bits of or three bits of the MSB, and then the LSB. So the top four bits of data and um, concatenate them together for the data. So on the Nexus A7, I've got two sets of four seven seven displays. So I'm gonna display X, Y, and Z in two digits and use a decimal point to represent if we're going in the positive or negative, the, the sign bit. So if you're using the basis three, you can just do this with uh, two bits of data. So you'll have from zero to seven and then represent that on one seven segment display. Here's a timing diagram for um, a register write to the sensor, which is the first thing we have to do. So right here's how the flow is going to go. We're going to wait at least five milliseconds after power up. I'm doing six milliseconds in my circuit. We're going to send a write instruction, which is 0A. Then we're going to send the 8-bit address, which is the 2D register, that power register to set it into measurement mode. And then the actual data byte to put it in measurement mode, which is hex. 0, 2. Then we're going to go to reading data. And just some more information from the data sheet. The measurement mode instruction is valid 40 milliseconds after being switched into measurement. Or actually, data is um, valid 40 milliseconds after you put it into measurement mode. So you have to wait at least 40 milliseconds before you start reading some data after this write um, sequence. And then the default data rate for updating the X, Y, and Z register is 100 hertz. So every 10 milliseconds, we'll have some new data put in each register. So here's how the read's gonna go. And we're gonna do a burst read. And how it's gonna work, so we're gonna wait 40 milliseconds for the data to be ready. We're gonna send CS low. We're gonna send the read instruction, which in this case is uh, 0B. And then we're gonna send the address. And the first address we're gonna send it to is uh, 0E, which is the LSB of the X data. And so um, the, the sensor will just keep putting out data. Well, the, the address pointer inside will auto increment to the next register of data, which is 0F, which is the X MSB, then 10111213, which is Y LSB, MSB, Z LSB, Z MSB. So we're going to actually just send the first address and then read in six bytes of data. Then we're going to send CS high to end the transmission wait for 10 milliseconds, and then go back to step two and start another read, another burst read. So here's the state transition diagram for the SPI master. So we're in, after we power up, I'm gonna wait six milliseconds, send CS low. This is where I, I send the uh, write command, the write address to 2D, send the byte to configure it into measurement mode, send CS high to end the write transmission. Wait 40 milliseconds for data to be valid after putting it into measurement mode. Send CS low. And then we're going to send the write command 0B. We send the uh, read address, which is 0E for the X LSB. We're going to receive 16 bits of X data, then receive 16 bits of Y data, then 16 bits of Z data. Send CS low to end the read transmission. Wait 10 milliseconds for another new set of data to be valid and then go back and loop back and do the read command all over again and we'll just loop right here. This is a continuous data burst read. Here's the block diagram I created for the circuit. So I've got the 100 megahertz clock coming in from the Nexus. The basis has the same megahertz clock. Um, I'm gonna create a four megahertz generator and send that into the SPI master. That's gonna be my overclock to time the uh, CS and uh, the S clock signals and also the MOSI signals around the one megahertz S clock. So inside here we'll convert um, four megahertz into one megahertz for the S clock going to the accelerator module, the uh, CS line going to the accelerator module, the MOSI master out, MISO coming back in, master in the data coming in. And I'm gonna take that X, Y, and Z data and send that over to seven segment control that's also going to be outputted onto 
uh, 15 LEDs, five LEDs per set of data. The first one is going to be the sign bit, and then the next four is going to be the four data bits. And of course, the 7 7 control controls the anodes and cathodes on the Nexus A7. I'm going to have the uh, X value on these first two. This is going to be nothing. The Y value here and the Z value here. And the decimal point behind each X, Y, and Z value is going to represent whether it's traveling in the positive or negative direction. Okay, here's the SPI master code in Verilog. Got a bunch of notes up here, just the state machine flow, and then notes that I gathered from the data sheet. And then I, I do have one question, whether the MOSI should be tri-stated when not transmitting. I'm not really sure about that, and I might try that after this. But here's where the module starts. We got the uh, eye clock coming in, which is the four megahertz from the eye clock generator. The uh, input, which is MISO, the mastering coming from the sensor, S clock going out to the sensor, MOSI going out to the sensor, the CS, the chip select going out to the uh, sensor, and then 15 bits of acceleration data, the sign bit, and then four bits of data for each axis. This is a register that creates control the S clock to turn it on and off um, to satisfy the C pole. So when there's no data, when there's no communication going on, I can use this register to just set S clock equal to zero. And uh, I'll show you the assign down at the bottom. And then, so I'm creating a one megahertz signal from a four megahertz signal. So for a 50% duty cycle, this is what, um, basically I just need to count to two. So zero and one, and then um, invert the clock register and end up with a, a one or four megahertz or one megahertz signal derived from that four megahertz signal. And this is the S clock. There's some signal de uh, declarations when I create a register with the right instruction, which is 0A, that power, or I call a mode register to write to, which is zero, uh, 2D, the mode register data, which is 02, which will put it into um, measurement mode, the read instruction, which is 0B, the XLSB address, which is 0E, uh, a 50 bit register to buffer the data coming in at a certain clock period. I'll show you that down below. And then 16 bits of X, Y, and Z data that come in on MISO. And this is a counter to synchronize the um, switching of the state machine or the transitions. And then a little wire for latching data when I want to latch the X, Y, Z data into temp data. Um, here are all the states. There are 93 total states. Um, here's the uh, parameters or local parameters for all of them. Here's the state reg, seven bits. We're gonna initiate it at, um, initialize it to power up state. And then here's the uh, state machine part. So every time at the I clock, I'm gonna increment the counter by one. And in the case of the state reg, we're gonna start off and power up. And we're gonna um, wait that six milliseconds, which is this many ticks on the counter. Go into beginning the SPI right. We're gonna send CS low and then start uh, sending the right command. So there's eight bits. So each bit is a state for sending the right command. We're gonna set MOSI to each bit of the uh, right instruction register, which, which is zero A for a right instruction. And then we'll send the address, which is 2D, to write to that um, register to change the mode. And here's the byte to put it into measurement mode. And then we'll end the transmission here by sending uh, S clock, turning S clock off. Also, um, let me go back up to the top here really quick. Right here, you can see where I'm turning S clock on by setting S clock control to one. Come back down. So once again, ending transmission. Gonna wait 40 milliseconds for our first uh, valid data. So that's this many ticks following um, Actually, I'm going to reset the counter here and then count up. And then to line up the S clock and the I clock uh, pause edges again, I'm going to wait an extra two ticks. Or three ticks, actually. And then um, I'm going to begin the SPI read. So I'll send CS low. I'll let the S clock run through. And 
then we'll go into sending the read command, which is the 0B. Then send the um, 8 bits of the address I want to read from, which is 0E, which is the X data LSB. And then we get the burst read. So I get 8 bits of the X LSB, 8 bits of the X MSB, 8 bits of Y LSB, 8 bits of Y MSB, 8 bits of Z LSB, 8 bits of Z MSB, and then we go into end SPI. And I'm going to turn off CS here and disable the S clock right here. And then go into this mode right here while we're wait for 10 milliseconds because that's the data rate. It's 100 hertz, so every 10 milliseconds we get a new set of data. And then I'll just loop back around to begin the SPI read. Yeah. And then here's the end of the module up here. We have the, uh, the data buffer like I talked about. I'm going to swizzle bits out of X. Y and Z and put them into a temperature or a temp temporary data register. And then that register is what's going to drive the accelerator data out of the module. Here's the latch data signal, which what I'm going to do is I'm actually using the neg edge here of the I clock. So I'm going to, when the state register is in SPI, in NSPI, we've finished our read. And then the counter is, um, one tick past coming into here. This is these are the counter values. So I'm coming in at 257. I'm going to wait to 258, and on the next neg edge, so it's one and a half ticks after entering into end SPI. I'm going to latch the data, and then here's the S clock control. Whenever S clock control is one, I'm going to allow the clock reg to drive the S clock signal out of the module. Um, otherwise, it'll be zero. So we'll satisfy the C pull equals zero and hang the S clock out at zero. Here's the test bench I created. I'm going to simulate this module in Icarus Verilog again. So I just got a, a clock, the uh, S clock, MOSI, and CS coming out. I'm not concerned with MISO because I'm not receiving any data in the simulation. This is just to check all the, uh, the master signals. Um, create a clock. Of course, with Icarus Verilog, you must specify the dump file which I call master underscore um, or SPI underscore master dot VCD, the value change dump file for GTK wave. I'm going to dump all the variables from um, all levels of the program. So the SPI uh, master uh, test bench and the SPI master itself. I'm going to initiate the clock to zero, let the simulation run for this many ticks and then finish. After running these commands for Icarus Verilog at my um, Windows PowerShell or the command line, then uh, GTK Wave will pop up. And here is GTK Wave. I've already got it set up so we can view the signals. So I selected the master module and then selected seven signals from the master, appended them into this wave window over here, changed the colors, I got the S clock at the top. I clock in yellow, the counter also changed the uh, data format to decimal, and the MOSI, the S clock control, the CS, and the state reg. And so this period right here, where we're in state 00, zero is that first period where we're waiting for six milliseconds. Then we're going to go through the, the right sequence, wait 40 milliseconds, and then each one of these small little areas is a read sequence, then we're waiting 10 milliseconds read sequence waiting 10 milliseconds now let me zoom in on so we can see the signals okay so right here is where we've just come out of the power up period right at this clock we go into state one, which is where we're going to transition the CS line down to zero and then also initiate the S clock control. So you can see how the S clock is, is, is zero. It's the, the C pole equals zero. So then right here at this first clock edge is when the first bit of data is valid. And the first thing we're going to do is send the, the right instruction, which is uh, zero A. So we got zero, 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 zero. And A is one, zero, one, zero. 
And then at this clock edge, we're going to start sending the read or the write address, which is 2D, so which is 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1. And then we're going to send the actual data that we want to write to that 2D address to put into measurement mode, which is a 0, 2. So 0, 0, 0, 0. And then 0, 0, 1, 0 is 2. And then we've completed our write transmission. We've configured it into measurement mode. And so we're going to turn, we're going to end the, the, uh, the communications by sending CS back to high and disabling the S clock going back to zero. And so now we're going to wait for that 40 milliseconds, which this, all this area is 40 milliseconds. Man, it's quite a ways out in terms of a, a four megahertz clock. 40 milliseconds is a long time. Man, can I get there any faster? Ah, there it was. So now we'll zoom in right here. So this is where we're going to start the, uh, the read. So right here we'll go into 1B. We'll send uh, CS low again. Let the S clock run through by finagling the S clock control to 1. And so the first bit for the read and uh, transmission or communication starts at this positive clock here. And the read command is 0B. So we're sending 0, uh, 0, 0, 0, 0, which is the 0, and B, which is 1, 0, 1, 1. Then on this clock edge, we're going to send the register we want to read from, which is 0E, which is the XLSB. So 0E. So we have 0, 0, 0. 0 and then e is 1 1 1 0 and then at this clock edge right here is when we're going to start receiving the uh, the access data so this is the lsb so we have eight bits of x lsb so 1 2 3 4 5 6 seven, eight bits of the LSB, then eight bits of the MSB, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then eight bits of Y LSB, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight bits of Y MSB, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight bits of ZLSB, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, then eight bits of ZMSB, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then right after that we're going to end the read communications and we go into, so we turn CS back high, we disable the S clock to, to go back to zero. And then this is where we're going to wait for 10 milliseconds. And then we'll go back through and do it all over again. So going out 10 milliseconds, we got that read loop again. Another 10 milliseconds read loop. So this is um, all the signals. It shows that it's working correctly. I'll take you over to Vivado and show the other modules and then show you it working on the board. Okay, here's the <clears throat> Vivado project. It's on a Nexus A750T target language Verilog. You can see the three modules over here inside the top module and the constraints file. So the first module I'll go through is the iClock Gen, which is creating a four megahertz signal from the 100 megahertz coming from the Nexus A7. So I had to do something a little different, excuse me, than I normally do. Because we can't do a 50% duty cycle because if we take 100 megahertz divide it by 4 megahertz and then divide it by 2 we get 12 and a half and it's not possible to split a bit into a half so the solution is 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 not to try and, and do the 50% duty cycle 
In this case, we just take the 100 megahertz, divide it by the 4 megahertz, and we get 25. So we just need to split the time of the high cycle and the low cycle. So we'll start the clock reg off at 1 right here, count up to 13, negate the clock reg, count up to 25, negate the clock reg, reset the counter, repeat. And this results in a 50% duty cycle where the period, uh, the high period of the 4 megahertz clock is 50% and the low period is 48%, which is fine, because it's still a four megahertz signal. The pause edge of the four megahertz lines up with the pause edge of the S clock, and everything's all good. And this is how the logic goes down here. So we'll count um, actually up to uh, 12, then invert it, then up to 24, invert it, reset the counter, do it all again. Otherwise, um, counter equals counter plus one, and the clock reg, of course, is the uh, output for the uh, clock four megahertz. So that four megahertz signal is being driven into the SPI master, which is right here. I got a, lo a lot of notes and stuff in here about, oh, we already covered that. So this is the same uh, module I just covered in, um, in Notepad++. I don't need to go through it again. The, uh, the data, the acceleration data coming out, going into seven segment uh, control right here the 15 bits and then in here we have the clock 100 megahertz from the nexus the uh, we're using uh, seven bits for the segments and using the decimal point by itself as a register and then the eight anodes and so the first thing you do is take that acceleration data and start swizzling out the bits so i've got a wire for the x sign y sign and z sign so the sign bit for each one is these bits of the acceleration data and then this is actually i changed it from six to four but so i'm getting four bits of x data from the x portion of the accelerator data the y portion for the y the z portion for the z and so now i can take these values right here and do the bcd conversion so i create um four bit wires for um, each of the BCD values, so the tens value of the X, the tens or the ones value of the X, same for the Y and the Z, and do the BCD conversion right here. So the tens value is divided by 10, and the ones value is modulus 10, giving us the remainder after dividing by 10. Here's the uh, segment parameter for segment patterns um, that I'm going to put on the displays. I also included a null because there's two displays that I'm just going to turn off when the anode select gets to that. And that's speaking anode select, that's all this stuff right here to drive um, all the anodes to the refresh rate. I got eight anodes on the Nexus. Of course on the basis three I only need to do four. And so then there's a case statement for driving the decimal point register and the segment register. This drives the anode register. So in the case of the anode select, far right digit I want the Z ones or, and but I'm actually going to use the, uh, the decimal point to represent um, negative or positive direction in the Z and then based on the Z ones uh, val BCD value I'm going to set the segments to the parameters for the number 0 through 9 um, and for the Z tens I'm not using the decimal point I'm just turning it off so in the case of the BCD value, setting the value, and then the same thing for the X and, and Y values. The Y will be up next, then the X will be on the far left. I'm sending null here. This is one of the anodes I'm not using. Here's a Y1s, Y10s. Um, not using this segment, uh, X1s and X10s. And then the top module just uh, instantiates those modules, ties them all in together. Um, here's how I, I'm swizzling the acceleration data for the LEDs as well. So I'm putting the five bits of X data on the top five bits of the LED. Um, and then the Y data, five bits here, Z data, five bits here. Here's the constraints file, bringing in the clock 100 megahertz using um, 15 of the LEDs, seven segments, the decimal point, eight anodes, and then I'm using the four main SPI signals from the sensor, the MISO, MOSI, S-Clock, and the CS, which is chip select. I'm not using the interrupts in this case. And now let me show you it on the board. All right, here's the Nexus A7 
Um, you can see the data is a bit quirky. I don't know what's going on here. I feel like my logic is correct, but it's reading. It's already reading. I know it's hard to see, but it's reading 15 for X, uh, 15 for Y, and 9 for Z. Um, the bottom of this thing, it has these uh, these little rubber bumpers. Well, the rubber bumper in this corner came off, came off so this thing kind of has a gangster lean to it. I don't know if that's affecting it, but if I push down on if I push down on this side, I get 15 in the Y. If I push down on this corner, Y goes to zero. And um, also, I found that if I rotate the board, you won't be able to see this. But if I make it vertical this way, Z is zero, Y is zero, and X becomes seven. And I've tried to orient this in different ways. The, uh, the data sheet actually shows you the direction for the chip, but I cannot for the life of me find the chip on this board anywhere, on the front or the back. And if it's on the back, then that means the chip is upside down right now, which shouldn't matter except for the Z direction showing positive and negative. But I can move the board in, in different directions and you can see, I think this is the X direction Notice the uh, when I drive it one way, the uh, the decimal point dis disappears for positive and negative. I think this is actually the x direction. You can see, um, and then this is the y direction. Yeah, this is the y direction. You can see the decimal point disappearing. The values changes for positive, and then and negative, and then this is the z direction. The decimal point stays high the whole time. So I don't know what's going on with that, but the negative bit, the Z never moves in the positive direction. It always has that decimal point lit, so it's in the negative direction. Um, you can see if, as, I, as I'm moving it all around, the LEDs, the values are changing. Like I said, it's a bit quirky. I don't know how else to represent this data as far as output devices on the Nexus A7. I have the LEDs and the seven segment display. Um, I guess I could drive it through the VGA, that would be uh, another <laughs> big part of the project, but um, but there, I think the uh, the SPI master is actually working, and so um, I've effectively communicated with the accelerometer, no matter what kind of data I'm getting out here. So, um, thanks for watching.